Amen. It's good to have everyone here this morning. We want to uh, welcome you to the D.C. Regional Christian Church. It's, it's so exciting to uh, be able to worship God this morning. Amen. I appreciate the singers as they give their hearts to bring us to the foot of the cross. Appreciate the communion message as we partake and celebrate the Lord's death, burial, resurrection. For all of us, we're so excited that we can have an opportunity to worship God this morning. Can we give God some praise right now? And so there we were in the jungle in Africa. It was about 48 of us. We were on the safari. Three jeeps totaling 16 people each. And we had seen every animal the Lord made in Genesis chapter 1. <laughs> But one animal we had not seen, and that was the lion. And so, so somebody in the group screams out, let's go to the lion's den. I was the only one in that group of 48 that said, why well, do we want to go to the lion's den? Everybody wanted to see the lion. And so they overruled me, and there we were headed to the lion's den. The first two jeeps went straight through the den. Our jeep. <laughs> now it's been said because we were jumping up like a bunch of village idiots <laughs> that the lion actually picked out his prey. <laughs> now I knew we were in trouble because everybody was jumping up and down. I was the only one seated in the gym. When we crossed into the den, Dad and I, and my eyes, met. This, this lion looked like a man. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Papa Lauren, I, I, I really, I, you know, I don't really want to be here. He said, but you're here. And I'm going to have to handle business. Dad and I got up. It was six of them total. Made his way around to my side of the Jeep. About 40 yards out. About from here to that door. And got in crouch position. I kid you not. Everybody in the Jeep was crying. <laughs> and, and listen, I did say that I was the only one that did not want to go to the lion's den. Did I not say that? You say, but Carlos, wasn't your wife with you? Like I said, I was the only one that did not want to go to the lion's den. My wife was like, let's go. Flash 
right before me. We were done. It was over. I knew I was dying in the jungle that night. And the gun just happened to be right in front of me. I looked at Papa Ryan, and I looked at the gun. The guy told me, he says, as he was flashing the lights back and forth, he says, don't touch that gun. <laughs> I later asked him why. He said, if I had put my hand on that gun, before I touched the trigger, the lion would have been in the jeep. They know what a gun is. This is a true story. <laughs> I mean, this is so true. This is what, this thing terrifies me even as I tell the story. Like, I could have died. And I really believe Papa was after me. Because we locked, we locked, we locked real, real good. Real good. Of course, we got out of that situation. <laughs> this is an amen. I think that's why I'm here this morning. <laughs> On our way back to our bus to take us back to our living quarters, we ran into a herd of buffalo. We just heard this. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Listen, I lost my hat. My favorite hat. My favorite hat. Flew off my head. I said, oh, my hat. The guy said, you want to go get us? So we heard the herd of buffalo coming, and they sent us off the road into the jungle again. It was horrible, man. <laughs> but it wasn't until we got home that night and Cassandra prayed. Cassandra said, thank you, God, for controlling the lives. Thank you, God for controlling the lions. I'm reminded of Daniel chapter 6, and verse 21 through 22. Just listen up. Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angels and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. And also toward you, O king, I have committed no crime. I've entitled today's sermon the church, a mission impossible. The church, a mission impossible. And before I dive in, I just want to connect with your heart if I could. Some of us are sitting here today. And you feel like you're in a jungle. <clears throat> That is trapped in a den of despair. You've lost the hope. You're not happy. People saying hallelujah, hallelujah, but you can't. I know that emotion. I've been in that den. I'm here to say that Jesus can make you happy again. Right. Some of us are in a den of secrets, a den of lies. You have secrets so deep and so dark, you can't tell any human. I understand that emotion. And so all you know to do is to retreat farther inside. And then you get old to come and put on a face that you know is not true. But we paint the smile. We know it's not true. We hide. You know, I used to wear a size small t-shirt. <laughs> this is an extra large. You know what I would look like up here with a size small? It wouldn't be a good look. <laughs> I got this shirt on to hide stuff. <laughs> Amen. 
Well... We dressed up the high. Remember Adam and Eve as they were there in the garden, they sinned against God, and what did they do once they realized they were naked? They put something around them to hide themselves. We tend to hide our sin because we know it doesn't look good. It's a bad look. Some of us are in a den of discouragement. And get this, we're in a den of discouragement because we have a history of disobedience. causes God to engineer discouragement in your life? I'll say that again. Disobedience causes God to engineer discouragement in your life. Why? Because God would rather you be discouraged for a season than for eternity. And what he does is he discourages the things we feel so deeply. You know why? Because what we feel so deeply will ultimately lead to our demise. And God will not have that. So he jumps in the way and he discourages the things that we're thinking about doing. And here we sit sometimes discouraged, but it's a good thing because God won't let you do what you want to do. Some of us are in the den. Different, amen? amen. I want to I transition. 
went with our appetizer. I want to transition into our main course, amen? I've entitled this message, uh, The Church, A Mission Impossible. And I told you that God creates these impossible challenges for us to extract out of us the very best in order to activate the impossible in our lives, the Holy Spirit. I think sometimes we forget how extraordinary the church is. Because sometimes we can take the church off the creator and start focusing on the creation, who, who you are, who I am. And we can start fighting each other. There's just all kind of conflict and situations, attitudes flying all around. But sometimes we don't realize that God created this mess. Well, let me remind you how it all happened. And, and, and while I'm talking, you can open your Bible to Acts chapter 2. One day, Jesus, this is found in Matthew chapter 16. One day, Jesus was hanging out with the fellas. And they came back to him, and they said to him, he asked them, when you go out and talk about me, who do people say I am? They said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. So I would say, one of the prophets, he says, but what about you? Who do you say I am? You see how personable Jesus is? Jesus says to them, listen, I'm really not concerned about what other people say. I'm actually concerned, what about you? Who do you say I am? This erases the fact that God is not concerned about our great-grandmother, grandmother, mother, father, sister, brother. He wants to know you. What do you say? Who do you say? Who, uh, who am I to you? So Peter spoke up. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. This was a divine moment. And he says, listen, on this rock, on that confession, what you just said, I will build my church. He says, the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Listen, let me tell you something. Listen up. The church will not lose. God will not lose. I make the, listen, I don't care what's going on around us. You're on a safe ship if you're selling with Jesus Christ. He says, listen, I will give you, Peter, change his name. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He says, whatever you lose on earth, earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. I'm going to give you the key. So, you know, right after that, Peter pulled the Lord aside and said, because the Lord started talking about dying. First of all, Peter was excited about the fact that he got the right answer. And then the Lord started talking about dying. So Peter pulls the Lord aside and says, listen, uh, you know, that's not going to happen. Like, we, you, you're not dying. See, what the, what the disciples, they saw this as a major opportunity. They thought Jesus was going to come somehow and rule in a physical sense. And they thought, man, we're going to be in his court. Who's going to be number one? Who's going to be number two? Who might be number three? Hey, if I'm number 12, that's cool. I got a good shot. So they were thinking, man, the Lord is going to, so Peter pulls him aside and he says, listen, you're not going to die. You know what the Lord said? Get behind me, Satan. You do not have the things of God in mind. Of course, we fast forward this day. We know what happened. Jesus died on the cross in Jerusalem. All the disciples ran away. They fled. They lost their faith. And then they found it. They realized that Jesus had resurrected from the dead and they were fired up, excited. Perhaps this thing might still happen. Maybe we still will be rulers. Still didn't quite understand the purpose of Jesus. Well, now we're in Acts chapter 2. And this is, this, is, this is around the ascension. Jesus is now about to leave. 
And he told the disciples, he says, listen, when I go, I'm going to send somebody back, really, to take my place. In other words, I'll walk with you, and a little bit I'm going to walk in you and through you. And so there he is, and he ascends into heaven. The disciples are there looking at him go up into heaven. They are just, man, you know how it is when you see someone you love leave and go away. And I'm sure their emotions were just overwhelming because they loved the Lord and he was gone. But he told them, he says, listen, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait for the gift my father promised. And so they went to Jerusalem and they waited there in the upper room. They also thought, well, you know, since we don't have Judas with us, we need to pick another disciple, one who has been with us from the beginning. So they picked Matthias, and there they were in Jerusalem, waiting as the Lord told them for what he was going to send from heaven. So there they are. Now here's what's so unique about this whole situation. The Lord decided to start his church on the weekend of what was known as the Feast of Pentecost. And so people from all over the known world had come and landed right there in Jerusalem. And they were just having a good time. It was celebratory. It was a party. It was awesome. And then something happened. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that came and separated and came to rest on all those who had walked with Jesus. The people were amazed because they saw these Galileans unschooled, ordinary men speaking in all these different languages. Like, what in the world is going on here? It was a beautiful situation, a beautiful day. They could see something they had never seen before. And listen, man, you know, who taught you how to speak like that? Nobody. I'm just speaking like that. I can't explain it, but it's just happening. Can you imagine just busting out right now in some French? And you've never been taught how to speak French? That's what we're talking about. And so the people there, they said, oh, 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 I know what it is. These men who are speaking, bless you, son. <laughs> These men who are speaking, they've had too much wine. They're drunk. And then it happened. Who had the keys to the kingdom of heaven? Say it loud. Just 
messing them up. And whatever, I'll tell you this quick story if I get back to my point. When we were in Providence, Rhode Island, and my wife was studying with this, this lady. We were working as engineers at General Dynamics. We didn't have any time. The only time I had to watch TV was on a Saturday, and what I loved doing on my Saturday was to watch college football. Well, that was the time that she I had a study with this young lady, and she just happened to come to the house every time I was watching football. <laughs> so she told my wife, I think your husband has a problem. <laughs> Somebody struggle. I wasn't a Christian. I was a Christian. But I was young. I, was, I had issues. Okay, I was. The Lord had to transform me. I was transformed, but not like, not like I am today. Jesus 
Christ and this lost and depraved generation. What did God create when he created the church? He created a mission impossible. Amen, bro. And he told the disciples, he says, listen, when I give you the gift that the Father promised, everything's going to change in your life. The disciples went from running away from the cross to, to, to running to the cross. When he created the church, he created a mess. I want to focus on, right now, just the expectations that God still has to this day. Whether you are fresh out of the waters of baptism or you've been, been here for 30 years like myself. The expectations never change. They're still true to this day. And he expects each of us as members of this community to follow these expectations. The first one in verse 1 and 2, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' seat to the fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. They devoted. Devotion is an expectation of Christ. It's an expectation. Now, the word devote in the Greek means they were addicted to. They were addicted to the apostles' teaching. They didn't have the dirt. The spirits like we have the Bible, the Holy Word. They would go to the temple to hear the Word, to hear the apostles, to see them speak the Word. Listen, the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit. These people would go every day, every day, every day to hear the Word. We have the Word in our home. My question is, are you devoted? Devotion is an expectation of Christ. It's an expectation of Christ. And something goes without saying. To be devoted publicly, you've got to be devoted privately. If you don't have a private devotion, you do not have a public devotion. You're fake. You show up and you do all this stuff for what? Why? Listen, we have to work on our private devotion. Last time I spoke, we talked about one hour of power a day. Getting God's word just for one hour. I mean, just one hour. Power up on the word of God. A lot of us said, hey, bro, I want to ask you, how's it going? So you didn't expect I was going to be up here speaking so soon. <laughs> yeah, he don't speak for about once a year. <laughs> Now, how is it going, devotion? On a scale from zero to ten, rate your private devotion. On a scale from zero to ten, rate your private devotion. Think about it. Does your devotion to Christ model obedience to his word? Like, how can you be devoted if you are not devoted to the word? How is that possible? Wow. Now, I'm not very smart. But I know this. You can't be devoted to Christ if you're not devoted to his word. You can't be devoted to the church if you're not devoted to the word. You, you see that? You see that? It's why. And it's not because I'm not doing a good job. Listen, we got to jump in the Word. you got to jump in that. you got to make yourself do it. It does not happen because you look at the Bible. Jump in the Bible. Be devoted to the Word. How is your devotion, your private devotion? Do you spend time? Psalms 42 says, As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. Are you devoted? The church is a mission impossible. And in order to accomplish this mission, you've got to be devoted to the Word of God. There is no other way. Or else we're just playing church. Hello, somebody. Amen, bro. They were devoted. They were devoted. Does your devotion model you serve and use in your home as a hospitality center? Opening up your home, inviting people in. Why do you think you have your home? 
back to God. Why do you think you have your home? For you? Or for you to open it up and show hospitality as Christ would have it? You with me right here? Amen. I'm not satisfied. Why do you think you have your home? A gift from God. When was the last time you used your home as a hospitality center to invite people in to have a meal? You know why it's so critical? You know what happens when you have a meal together? You get happy. Food makes you happy. Yes. <laughs> you just start talking. Yeah. <laughs> Which one is you? There are people who give 
Give what? Give their time. Give their money. Give their heart. Give their emotions. They give themselves away. There are people who give, and then there are people who take. Are you a giver? Write it on your paper, don't say it out loud, and friend, don't tell another friend, you're a taker. No, listen, <laughs> write it down. Write it down, go have some good time with the Lord, and say, you know what, Lord, I've been a taker, but now I want to be a giver. It's just that simple. There's so many opportunities in the fellowship. No one should be sitting on the bench. No one. Because here's the thing, and here's the scary thing. If you don't use what God has given you, that's scary. I remember growing up, and of course my father was a musician, and he would make me and my sister sing at these tent revivals down south. I mean, tent revival come to town, I, yours truly was singing. I was seven, six, seven years old. I was terrified. I would be singing and crying at the same time. <laughs> People thought I had the spirit. It wasn't the spirit. It wasn't the spirit. It wasn't the spirit. But I remember getting of age and I ran away from singing. Because it was just a bad experience. So when I moved away, I left everything behind me that the Lord had given me. One day, the minister was up giving a sermon, and he says, we need you who are sitting out there with these gifts to come forward. We need worship leaders. Well, they said song leaders back then. Well, I heard it, but I didn't move. I didn't go forward. There was a sister, a white sister. She's in Australia. I owe so much to this. I've preached this for years, and one day I'm going to be able to tell Emily exactly how she changed my life that day. Well, there I was, wasn't going forward. She walks up to me. She says, if you don't use it, God's going to take it away. And then she walked off. She didn't even know me. <laughs> She walked away, and I was just standing there. God's mad. <laughs> I didn't go forward. I went home. I went to Louisiana. We're sitting around the table. We're talking. Everybody talking about where they were born. I said, yeah, I was born in a charity hospital. My sister said, who told you that? I said, well, that's what's on my birth certificate. She said, mama never told you what happened. <laughs> I said, no, Mama never told me what happened. She says, you were not born at Charity Hospital. You were born in a car. Your name is Carlos. Talk about, ain't nobody asked me to serve. Come on, lazy Christian. Listen, 
You got on this ship for free. Gratitude should make you serve. Amen, bro. Just gratitude. Nobody should have to ask anybody to do anything because listen, some of us got gifts that we don't even know about. In Providence, it was just a stroke of divine intervention that this girl came up to me and said, if you don't use it, God's going to take it away. You got gifts. Some of you got gifts and you're sinning. It's not right. I'm sorry. Amen, bro. <laughs> they gave. They gave. You know, we, we have MVPs in this congregation. The setup team, they come in every morning before everybody gets here. And they love it. They just love doing this. I mean, they're here before the worship singers. Set it up for us to have worship. The worship team. Can we thank them for what they do? Did you know that? You know that because you can't do it out there, right? Amen. No, they rehearsed. They were at rehearsal yesterday for a long time, preparing for today. Can we give it up? Shopping. 
That just took her off balance for a little bit because, and we got people coming over. But my baby gave in and said, listen, let's go. We went back. The couple was standing right there. I said to the couple, I said, listen, I just walked through you. And the Holy Spirit put on my heart to invite you to church, and I didn't do it. And I feel really bad. And so I'm back to ask you, would you like to come to church? It was a quiet moment just like this. <laughs> <laughs> trying to process. Trying to process. And she says, uh, oh wow. Then my wife, listen, let me tell you something. When the team is working it, ain't nobody better than Cassie, Carlene. <laughs> wife jumped in that camp, but boom! You know, women just got something men don't have. Yes. Drew the couple in. The lady goes, we just moved here, actually, and we're looking for a church. Now, who knew that? God. The Lord. The Holy Spirit knew that, sent me on the mission. I walked through it, didn't obey. Holy Spirit, I, oh no, you didn't. Go back. <laughs> Go back. Answer prayer. Listen, you are answered prayer. Jesus is walking in you. He is walking through you. You are answered prayer. You cannot walk by and stay quiet. Selfish, selfish, selfish. Come on. This is an impossible mission. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You see why you need to have great devotion? That's right. So you can be what? In tune. In tune. In tune. So you can be on the same frequency as the Holy Spirit. So you can talk like Him. See what He sees in the moment. And execute it. It's an opportunity that God created for you to show up and for Him to show out. Don't let the Lord down. Holy Spirit hit that guilt button. We went back, man. Great conversation. It was incredible. Incredible. So what I learned from that, which I already knew but was reminded, is I'm at the store to shop my faith. Oh yeah, to get some bread. But to shop my faith. I'm at work to work my faith. Oh yeah, I gotta work my job. But to work my faith. I'm at the gym to exercise my faith. Oh, yeah, I gotta exercise my body, but to exercise my faith. I'm at the pump to fill up my faith. Oh, yeah, I gotta get some gas, but I'm there to fill up my faith. <coughs> Everything you do, <laughs> it's about Him. If you're on the ship. Now, if you're not on the ship, that's another story. But if you're on the ship, Enjoying all the amenities, enjoying everything the Lord provides. <laughs> Listen, you gotta do something. I wanna close with this. Four things to cultivate and to govern your devotion. Going forward. Four things. Of course, we talked about the one hour of power. You've got to plug into what? The Word of God. You've got to plug in. You've got to plug in. You cannot let yourself go out without being full of the Word of God, without being full of the Spirit. Do not go out on the third of a tank. Do not go out on empty. Go out full of, full of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Number two. Of course, you have to pray. Prayer is simply you keeping company with God. You have somebody over to the house, it's called company. What do you do when people come to the house? 
You keep them coming. You don't just go do something else and they're at the house. People come to the house and you leave. No, you sit down and you talk. You have a good conversation. That's prayer. Prayer is keeping company with God. You have to keep better company with Jesus Christ. And so you sit him down at the table. Listen, I remember a sister back in Providence, Rhode Island. This is what she used to do every day. She would set a table for two, her and God. Kid you not, it was incredible. At the time, I didn't understand it, but now I do. She would set the plate, set the, 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 the silverware, she would set the glass, and she would sit down and have lunch with God every day. Like, whoa. That's, that's far out. No, that's, that's how she made him real to her. So pray. You've got to pray. You've got to pray. Here's another one. Number three. Fast. When was the last time you fasted? I'm talking about from food. Like you want something, you want something really bad? Bad enough to fast? What I started realizing about me is I was asking God for some things. I wasn't fasting. I wasn't fasting. Like God is like, oh, you don't want it that bad. You don't want it that bad. Think about it. Is fasting a part of who you are? Do you fast? Will you give up something? To get closer to him. Do you fast? And then this meditation. Solitude. You know, sometimes we don't want to be alone because, man, we've done some things in our lives and being alone with the Lord is the worst person in the world to be alone with because he knows the depths of our Do something with me right now. Close your eyes, please. Meditation is a beautiful thing. How I do it, I put some music on that goes playing in the background right now. I close my eyes, and what I want to do is I want to find the center of God's will. The center of God's will, there's peace there. What's disturbing your peace right now? Like, can you be at peace? Can you sit still and be at peace? Paul says, I've learned the secrets of contentment, whether well-fed or not, with much or little. He learned that to find peace, he had to fight for the middle, fight for the center, fight where it was calm. Jesus was in the middle. Fight for the middle. Meditate on that. Use the scripture to direct your thoughts. And if you're not good at it, it's only because you've been out of shape doing it. You keep doing it over and over every day, and you find this peace. Find you some music that, that sets the mood, that makes it right. That you and God, it's just you and Him, and you're finding peace. In the center, there's obedience. Jesus says, listen, you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say. Jesus wants us to be obedient. What's stopping you from being obedient? Listen, find the middle. Find the middle. Deliberate from the center. Find the middle. That's where you've got to be. But you've got to set the mood in order for this to go right in your life. You can open your eyes. Listen, God wants to do some incredible things with your life, but it's going to take a mean effort. The church really is a mission impossible. But it's possible through Jesus Christ. And he's created this church. He's created this church. You know why he created the church? To turn a mess into a messenger in order to carry the message of Jesus Christ to a lost generation. That's the only reason. That's why you're here. There's nothing else more important than that. Are you on board? Are you understanding what's really going on? Listen, let me tell you something. He wants to activate out of you the kind of faith that will turn the Holy Spirit on. The power of the Holy Spirit can do it, no matter what it is. You feel despair, the Holy Spirit can get you out of it. You feel discouragement, the Holy Spirit can make you encouraged. You feel disobedience, listen, the Holy Spirit will make you obey. Pray, ask Him, give me strength to obey. You're afraid, you, you have fear, ask the Holy Spirit to give you courage. That's what a God 
God. Father, we're so grateful for who you are and what you do, and thank you for the church. God, this is the greatest gift that we have. Help us to all pitch in. Be the very best that we can be so that you can be glorified. We love you. We're grateful. We're thankful. We're appreciative for all that you do, for all that you get to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, bro.